Tis the season to be haunted by spectral apparitions. I'm Lucy, and this week on Footnoting History, I'm talking about one of the lesser-known Victorian Christmas traditions, ghost stories. Marley was dead, to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. Those are, of course, the opening lines of the most famous of Victorian Christmas ghost stories, but there's a lot more where A Christmas Carol came from. Charles Dickens mastered and influenced the tropes of this genre, as he mastered and influenced so many others. He didn't invent the Christmas ghost story, though, although he may have reinvented it through Christmas Carol and other tales, and through the works he saw to publication as a magazine editor. The Christmas ghost story, though, was a robust Victorian tradition in its own right. Elizabeth Gaskell, of North and South fame, also wrote a number of Gothic tales, the foremost of which takes place from late November through early January, around the turning of the new year. In this episode, I'll be looking at the key elements of this genre and some of its historical roots. Why did people tell ghost stories at Christmas? To American listeners, especially, this may seem like an incongruous pairing, but there are a number of justifications. First, the basic reasons. It's cold, it's dark, and it's a good time for parties. To quote a folklorist of the early 20th century, Christmas sheds a halo of joy around the last days of the expiring year. So what better time to gather with friends and swap spooky stories? But there's also a big fancy reason for telling ghost stories at Christmas time. Liminality. Liminality is a term lovingly employed by academics to describe times, things, states, places that seem to hover around a threshold rather than being firmly one thing or firmly another. And Christmas takes place during a time between years, as it were, and, religiously, a time between seasons. For bonus points, Christmas is also, to state the obvious, a religious celebration that is dependent on a breaking down of the boundaries between the natural and the supernatural, the mundane and the seemingly impossible. To state the perhaps even more obvious, it's also a time where multiple religious traditions are vigorously blended. So it's a favourable time for visitors from a vaguely defined other world to be abroad. The English tradition of ghost stories at Christmas is carried on well into the 20th century, with references in the oeuvre of Agatha Christie and elsewhere, but it had its heyday during Victoria's reign, and for this too there are historical reasons. Along with the 19th century faith in progress came a worry, understandable, about the limits of understanding. More and more of the world was being explored, classified, understood. What space did this leave for the mysterious? Ghost stories gave space to the irrational, the unexplained, the unpredictable, that was increasingly hard to find in an era of rapid travel, exhaustive news, new technologies, extensive exploration, and scientific discovery. So why the visitation of spirits at Christmas, particularly? In discussion of ghostly visitations in Hamlet, Horatio famously suggests that Christmas is a time when no malevolent spirits are capable of acting. Quote, no fairy takes, nor witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is that time. So Christmas is the only time in all the long year when one could, theoretically, see ghosts without defensively freaking out because they might be evil. Now, while this is true during Christmas tide, that begins on Christmas Day precisely, tradition has it that the hour just before Christmas starts, and when many ghost stories take place, is a time when evil spirits, or even the devil himself, might be particularly active. Moreover, many European cultures have traditions of fortune-telling around this time. 
It's worth noting that Scrooge's famous visitors, who so ambiguously tell his future, all come around this particular midnight moment of supernatural influence, with Jacob Marley coming straight from hell, or at least vague Victorian purgatory, before midnight, and the more benevolent spirits afterwards, with the ghost of Christmas yet to come, the most ambiguous of the three, straight on the stroke of twelve. An 1888 article remarks that, quote, Ebenezer Scrooge was not the only person haunted by Christmas ghosts. Such visitations are common enough to all of us." Unquote. I confess that I had an impulse to dive under the bedclothes mid-research. The author turns out, however, to be discussing the ghostly visitations of nostalgia, complete with a village dance that is compared to the Fezziwig's ball. Parenthetically, if you have not actually read A Christmas Carol and delighted in the Fezziwig's Ball, please treat yourself to that. But these ghosts are not without their sinister qualities. The author goes on to describe ghosts of dead laughter, ghosts of our former selves, and surely there are none so terrible as these. Moreover, the author suggests that these terrible ghosts are a particular peril of the quote-unquote superior civilization in which the late Victorians found themselves, in a disenchanted age, or at least, as Laura Forsberg has noted, an age that had an ambivalent relationship to enchantment. The Victorian relationship of science to the supernatural was an uncertain one. New technologies could be used to prove the impossibility of old beliefs, but also to expand the scope of what was possible. Ruskin famously tried to reconcile science and spiritualism, because of course he did. Even more famously, Arthur Conan Doyle, that ophthalmologist-turned-author, was also a devotee of spiritualism who tirelessly promoted to anyone who would listen. Is the ghost story a way of reaffirming belief in the supernatural? Of providing hard evidence of things unseen? Or perhaps both? The narrator of a 1901 short story proclaims that she believes, quote, in very little that I could not see unless indeed it was scientifically proven, unquote. This in itself is an interesting declaration to me, as it acknowledges that science was increasingly positing proofs for the unseen, from bacteria to mental illness to sexual orientation. While many scientific discoveries and debates were cause for anxiety as well as excitement, the legitimacy of scientific inquiry itself was fairly secure. This same story goes on to say, Quote, this talk of the supernatural, which is everywhere in the air at present, has seemed to me to be only a sign of the times, the outcome of overwrought nerves, or at best a morbid hankering for untried experiences. Unquote. That sentence wins late Victorian anxieties bingo, expressing the fear that many people felt that all this progress, all this rapid change, might be taking them somewhere they didn't really want to go, might be taking them across frontiers better left uncrossed. Multiple scholars have observed that the Victorian ghost story is difficult to define in terms of genre. Its ghosts can do so many different things, from protesting the restricted legal rights of women, to condemning an excess of rationalism, to just being vaguely creepy. Moreover, Victorian ghosts could be aggressively lifelike or vividly dead, to quote Nina Auerbach, in their ability to scold people and even to manipulate matter. Uh, there's a whole metaphysical debate about spirits being able to manipulate matter, but that's a subject for another time. Ghost stories, metaphysical or not, were a genre that not only enjoyed enormous success, but that came to spoof themselves. A character in E.F. Benson's Between the Lights, for instance, complains that the paraphernalia of ghosts has become somehow rather hackneyed, and when I hear of screams and skeletons, I feel I am on familiar ground and can at least hide my head under the bedclothes. For those of you wondering, 
Yes, that is the same E.F. Benson who wrote Map and Lucia. And yes, this intro is tongue-in-cheek. But it proceeds to move from mockery of stereotypically horrid skeletons to a genuinely creepy tale of hallucination and nightmare and, just maybe, crossings between worlds. This trend towards ghost stories being horrifying almost in spite of themselves seems to gain ground in the waning of Victoria's age. Andrew Caldecott's Christmas Reunion, for instance, is an homage to M. R. James, and it includes semi-comic monetary poetry as follows. To sons of peace, Yule brings release from worry at this tide, but men of crime this holy time their guilty heads need hide. It's so bad, and I love it. Christmas Reunion also features a gift of M.R. James' collected ghost stories from one character to another. A broad wink, if you will, to the audience about exactly the type of story they have to deal with. But this story, so anodyne on the surface, is also a tale of vengeance postponed and taken, of violence breaking the calm surface of the character's safe bourgeois existence. Not all Christmas-related Victorian ghost stories took place at Christmas, but Christmas was still, from the middle of the period onwards, a time for their distribution. A Robert Louis Stevenson story published at Christmas, The Body Snatcher, was advertised by coffin-wearing men on the streets of London. So if you've ever taken seasonal work wearing an oversized sandwich board, Take comfort, it could be worse. Sandwich boards shaped like coffins aside, many of M.R. James' acclaimed ghost stories were in fact designed for boozy, spooky Christmas parties with his close friends. These, incidentally, have been filmed by the BBC with gloriously ghoulish relish as Ghost Stories for Christmas, starring none other than Christopher Lee as M.R. James himself. It's hard not to read such stories as reflecting, in some way, anxieties about what lay outside the parameters of the known, for their characters and readers alike. Ghost stories show us genteel Victorian society as self-aware, at least to some degree, about a world much broader than that of rambling country houses and cosy parlours. At Christmas, when want is most keenly felt, and abundance rejoices, to quote Charles Dickens again, ghosts were invited to join the family circle, to suggest what might be left out, to suggest what might demand to be let in. And so, on the boundary between years, on the boundary between worlds, people held boozy parties and listened for things that went bump in the night. May all your parties, gentle listeners, be haunted by only benevolent spirits. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.